Hi students, this is Mrs. Wildy. This is our chapter one review for test. Um, I would recommend having your study guide out. I think that would be a good tool to use to make sure you're answering your questions correctly. Um, remember, you are responsible for questions that are found in the chapter and may or may not be discussed in this video lecture, uh, although this covers the majority of it. Um, we're going to start just with a basic understanding of what human geography is. It's the study of how people make places, why we do what we do, um, sort of the, the why of where and the why of, of people. So anything that relates to how humans have impacted their world is related to human geography. Um, the field note is really important. I always recommend reading it both at the beginning of the chapter and then again at the end. These field notes are a really good way of seeing the concepts of the chapter in real world examples. So the geographer that talks about um, the Kenyan coffee milk plantations, it's discussing how the, Kenya has lots of arable land, yet it still has many malnourished people. The land that can be growing food is not being used to grow food. It's being used by foreign corporations to grow coffee and tea and luxury crops things that aren't necessary for life, but that make more money. They also discuss the idea that, that there's really, there's inequalities in the world and the countries that have lots of arable land may not have lots of money or may have high caloric intake, in which case you may have to look and see why that is. You may also have countries that are, that are, have very little arable land and yet are some of the richest countries in the world. Namely, Bangladesh is the one that has lots of arable land, but still lots of malnourishment. And, and Norway is the one that has very little arable land, but is one of the richest countries in the world. Um, along with that, it makes sense to talk about globalization. This, this is something you can look at on a local scale, just understanding why Kenya has coffee plantations instead of uh, farm for food. But also, you have to rescale and look at it more on a global um, scale so that you see the reason for that and the and the relationships that exist between countries why Kenya sells their land to these corporate corporations in foreign countries to be able to make a little bit of money whereas those foreign corporations rely on that land for growing the things that make them money um, so it's important that we look at the effects of globalization um, and why our world seems to be shrinking as a result of it. Um, the geographic inquiry fo focusing on the spatial. So the spatial should be a word you, you think about area. So the spatial arrangement of places is, is sort of how, where things are on the earth. Um, and we, anytime we look at like the spatial concept, that's just an idea within a space, within an area. It's important that we use these terms and, and be able to understand, again, that that how are things organized? Why are they there? Why do people do what they do? That's very much a, a part of human geography and, and really the, the core focus of this chapter. The chapter also discusses medical geography and looking at um, how maps can show us where diseases are and also how they spread. So again, remember Dr. Snow's um, map of cholera cases in London in 1854. He was able to tell which water pump had been contaminated because of mapping, of because of geography, because of the spatial distribution of the disease. The chapter also, one of the main um, ideas of this chapter is the five themes of geography, location, place, movement, human environment, interaction, and region. We're going to talk, dive a whole lot into four of these. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about human environment interaction, although certainly I think it's it's understandable what that is in, in terms of how humans have impacted the environment and how the environment has impacted humans. But we're going to start with location. The question you should always ask with location is where is it? You can answer that question by giving absolute location, latitude and longitude, or you can give your situation or your relative location. I am next to... Publix or north of 
uh, Florida or whatever. So these are both used to, to explain where is it. Place, you should ask the question, what is it like there? This is going to give you that, that question of sight, the physical characteristics that you see there, the weather, the climate, the flora, the fauna, as well as place should also remind you that it's the human characteristics of the place, the schools we build, the religion we practice, the language we speak, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, all of those things are, are a part of place as well. Movement is another theme of geography. How do people, goods, ideas spread? Diffusion should be a part of this. You should remember that when we talk about any sort of people or ideas diffusing, cultural diffusion, migration, that that's all part of the movement theme. Um, along with that idea of movement or relocating is that you have an, an imprint on the cultural landscape. We always leave a mark where we, where we are, especially if a huge group of a culture comes to a place, they want to leave their mark. So this picture is specifically in Kenya, um, which you might not know this, but there's a large Hindu population in Kenya. It, it comes back all the way from colonization and the, and the Europeans wanting um, people to work the land in Africa after they'd sent all the Africans to the New World for, for labor there. Um, and that as a result, we see the imprint of that culture group, the Hinduism, on Kenya, on Kenya's landscape. Um, sequin occupants goes along with this in the idea that you can see multiple groups affect on a landscape. So you may see the Muslim influence, you may see um, a British influence, you may see uh, even more modern day versus versus historic buildings. All of those show us the history of the landscape and how humans have left a mark there. Um, we also go into types of maps in this unit quite a bit in terms of introduction. The, the biggest ones we talk about are reference maps and thematic maps. Um, reference maps, of course, of course, we use to refer to things. Most likely that's going to be like a street map as seen here, whereas um, Thematic maps have a specific idea that is, is conveyed in the map. Chloropleth maps are use color to show data. So this is a thematic map, but it's also a chloropleth map. It's a type of thematic map. Again, the darker tends to, color, to show you a higher concentration of something. Um, we also make mental maps or use mental maps to tell people how to get places. Um, it's from our experiences, our perceptions of places. We carry it with us and we it, it, it sort of forms a, a basis of our perceptions of people and places and why people do what they do. Um, activity space is another vocab term that, that we're going to use throughout the year and it has to do with just places. So think spatial, so an area where people engage in activity there. Maybe a school, it may be church, it may be a home, business. Um, maybe a park, but whatever we're doing, we are a making maps by, related to that, but also engaging in an activity that that forms our identity of who we are. GIS, Geographic Information Systems, this is a software system that um, layers maps. You download the software system and then you can layer maps one on top of each, each other to typically what is, this is used for is urban planners tend to use this for location theory. So they decide the best place to put something based on the information that they layer in the software system. This is different from GPS, where global position, positioning um, system, that's where it uses satellites. Um, in order to tell you where you're at and where you need to go. A remote sensing is similar in that you are looking at, at information. Think of it more of, of looking at satellite images or pictures taken from an airplane where you're looking at the aftermath of something. So you can see what, what the difference is before and after a situation, but you don't have to be in the area to see it. So this is a great picture of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. You can see the devastation of the land, but you, and you don't necessarily have to be in New Orleans to be able to tell that. So remote sensing is something that people use, not just geographers. Um, moving on, especially with maps, scale is important, and it's it's two different types of scale. We can talk about scale in terms of a map where you might have 
you know, one inch equals one mile. So it represents what it is in reality versus on that piece of paper. But you can also think about scale on a, on a contextual basis, meaning you can look at something from a local scale, like from your city, all the way to a regional, national, and national actually is smaller than regional, or global scale. So when you look at something at a local scale, you're going to see a very different picture than if you stand back and look at it from the global scale. But you need to be able to rescale and look at both of those areas or multiple areas to really tell the, the, the impact it has had. So these are again some, some scale maps. Um, the one to the to the right, top right, is going to be the larger scale, even though it's a smaller area, more detail is given, so it's a larger scale, versus the the map to the top left would be a little bit medium. Um, and then the, the largest one is the largest area, excuse me, is the smallest scale because it's so large. And that's the world map. Um, last theme of geography is region. And there's three types of regions, formal, functional, perceptual. Formal regions are clear, defined boundaries. You know when you've entered it. You know when you've left it. There's probably a sign or you, you sense not even in a sense, you, you hear or you see differences from where you were to where you are as you enter it. Functional regions have a clear, distinct purpose. You know when you've entered it um, because it has a, a clear purpose, um, like a school or a library. But if there was no need for that purpose, it wouldn't be there at all. Perceptual regions are once we have a different perception or idea of what happens there and the boundaries are kind of fuzzy so some people may feel like it is um, the boundary stops at this state and other people may feel like it goes further north or further west or whatever so think about some sp some specific examples this is a a perceptual region of north america where you might consider northwest um, versus south um, we would probably even do a southeastern uh, classification as well. But again, these are perceptual. So somebody's version of those boundaries was based on their ideas of what happens or where the boundaries are, but somebody else may have a different view. You should also remember to look at the regions of the world according to the College Board. So this is their map from their um, sort of content uh, breakdown. And I will be asking you questions on the test that'll be like, you know, which of the following regions would you find Indonesia or China or Brazil. You should know those big countries. I'm not going to ask you some that, some that we haven't really discussed a lot. They're going to be big countries you've heard of, but you should be able to understand whether they are East Asia or South Asia or Southwest Asia or what have you. So this is a good map to look at. Last part of the chapter really deals with culture. And we have a whole chapter on culture in the future, but this is sort of an introduction to it. So Culture, again, is, is a term that identifies the lifestyle of people, what they believe, what they wear, what they, what they eat, um, how they feel about things. And those, those are not things we're born with. We are, we are taught our culture. Culture trait is just one specific attribute of our culture. So we perhaps could say eating with chopsticks is a culture trait. Um, a culture complex is a little more advanced. It's more, it's it's multiple culture traits that sort of relate together, and they give you a much bigger picture of the culture. And then a culture hearth is the term for the for the place where the culture trait began, where it originated. Um, diffusion has again a part to do with, with culture and how connected we are based on our relationships with others and how their culture traits may get spread to different parts of the world. Um, it's important to understand that a long time ago it was very difficult for culture traits to spread because of the distance. But nowadays we have something more related to time-space compression where distance doesn't matter as much because we have such high-tech technology or high, high um, levels of communication, media, access to all that thing, it doesn't really matter how far away it is. So time and space have been compressed down where the hearth can be thousands of miles away from where it's been diffusing to, but the diffusion happens very quickly because of that communication and technology. 
Um, remember with diffusion, you have both two main types, expansion and relocational. Relocational means people have to move, whereas expansion means the idea moves, but people don't move. And among expansion, you have contagious, hierarchical, and stimulus. Contagious means it gets to all people at one, to as many people as possible all at once, um, or doesn't really care who it is. It wants as many people as possible. Hierarchical will pick and choose certain people first before it goes to other places. And stimulus means it moves from, um, it has to change before it can diffuse into other places. So these are some pictures I really like in terms of contagious and hierarchical. I don't really have a, a, an image for um, stimulus other than, of course, our classic example of um, uh, McDonald's in India, which means that, again, the McDonald's had to change their product in order to be diffused into India. I'll be right back with another video lecture in just a second.